Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the insulin receptor. Okay, so we've discussed the peripheral actions of insulin now. What we want to see now is how um, insulin actually achieves these effects by acting on insulin receptors on the surface of these three types of cells. Okay, so let's start by looking at the structure of the insulin receptor. So the insulin receptor is basically a tetramer. It consists of four uh, separate little polypeptides joined together. Okay, so let me show its structure then. So if we have uh, the cell membrane here, so let's say this is the cell membrane, and now in the cell membrane what we're going to have is two beta subunits, okay? So here is a beta subunit, like so, okay? And here is another beta subunit here, okay? And these are uh, membrane, well, they're integral membrane proteins. They have a uh, extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, and then a cytoplasmic domain, okay? And they are both identical, so they're both beta subunits. So this is a beta subunit and this is a beta subunit. And then both of them are then attached to another type of subunit known as an alpha subunit. So here's an alpha subunit. So this is an alpha subunit. And here is another alpha subunit here. Okay. So there's an alpha subunit. And then uh, this alpha subunit and this beta subunit are linked by disulfide bonds. And it's not one, there's far more than one. Um, and then again, this alpha and beta subunit. Again, this, is, this alpha and this beta subunit are identical to this alpha and this beta subunit. So uh, when I said that this one is linked by multiple disulfide bonds, then these two are also linked by multiple disulfide bonds. Okay, and now finally the two alpha subunits are linked and again by multiple disulfide bonds. So let's colour this in then. So, in pink then we have the alpha subunit here, well one of the alpha subunits, then we have an identical other alpha subunit and the two are linked together by disulfide bonds. And insulin will bind somewhere up here. Okay, uh, then we also have these two beta subunits which are now shown in red one here, like so, and another one over here. Right, so this is the structure of the insulin receptor. Okay, so it's a tetramer. It's made up of two alpha subunits and two identical beta subunits. So this is the insulin receptor. Okay, right. Now, there is only one gene for the insulin receptor, okay? So we somehow need to reconcile this because I've told you there is f two different proteins that you need to make this up, two different polypeptides, but only one gene. Okay, so what happens is this gene will be transcribed into a piece of mRNA. Okay, this mRNA will be then translated into a polypeptide. And basically, this polypeptide, which is known as the alpha-beta sequence, so let's have it here, this is the alpha-beta sequence. It contains both an alpha, uh, well, sorry, it contains both the alpha subunit and the beta subunit. So both of them are within this alpha-beta sequence. So what you will do is you'll chop it up and you'll get an alpha subunit and you'll get a beta subunit. Okay, so that's how you make both subunits from just one gene. Okay, so you'll use this gene twice to get two uh, alpha subunits and two beta subunits, basically. You'll bind them all together, and then you've got your insulin receptor here. Now, even though there is one gene, there are actually two types of insulin receptor, because basically there are alternative splice variants. So basically, there is an exon within um, the um, gene for uh, the insulin receptor. And basically, you don't have to include it. So let me show this. So if we have our gene here, let's say this is our insulin receptor gene, okay, like so, then what will happen is this gene will be transcribed into a piece of mRNA that will be complementary to the coding strand, okay? And this is the pre-mRNA, before we've actually spliced out the introns, okay? And this will have a huge number 
of exons and introns. So there are portions which are actually going to be used uh, in the translation process. And we'll color these in, not in red, we've already used red. We'll color them in in green. So the exons are the portions which will actually be used in translation. So there are loads of these. And in between the exons, there are introns, which are portions of junk DNA, effectively, that will not be used in the translation process. So in green, this is an exon. Okay, and then in the colorless portion, this is an intron. So, to turn the pre-mRNA, which is just an exact copy of the, well, an exact complementary uh, piece of uh, nucleic acid to the coding strand of the DNA, into a mature piece of mRNA, what you have to do is cut out the introns and glue the exons back together. Now, basically, there is an exon known as exon 11, Okay, so this isn't the 11th one, but just to get the point across, I've labelled this up as exon 11. Okay, uh, and exon 11 does not have to actually be included. You can either include it or you don't have to include it, basically. So you can delete it as though it's an intron, basically, and it, you still make a functional alpha-beta sequence. Now, if you do include exon 11, what happens is the alpha protein that you actually make uh, the alpha polypeptide here has 12 extra amino acids, so it doesn't affect the beta um, piece at all. All this affects is the alpha piece, and the alpha piece gets 12 extra uh, amino acids. Okay, so exon 1 produces 12 extra amino acids on uh, the alpha subunit, and alpha-alpha is short for amino acid, and I realized that was probably uh, a bad time to choose to use that uh, shorthand, but never mind. Okay, so you get 12 extra amino acids on the alpha subunit. Okay, now if you make a uh, insulin receptor where you have two beta subunits, and note that there is no way you can change the beta subunit. Uh, exon 11 does not affect the beta subunit, it affects the alpha subunit. Okay, um, so you, you use two beta subunits and then you use two alpha subunits which do not have these extra 12 amino acids. Then you get what is known as the insulin receptor A. Okay, so the insulin receptor A does not have those extra 12 amino acids on the alpha subunit. So you didn't include exon 11, basically. So IRA is short for insulin receptor A. Okay, if you do, on the other hand, use uh, exon 11, and therefore the alpha subunits you produce do have these extra 12 amino acids, then you produce what is known as IRB, the insulin receptor B. So there are two forms of the insulin receptor. There is the insulin receptor type A, and there is the insulin receptor type B, and they all come from this single gene, basically. And what's changed is whether the alpha subunit has two extra, sorry, 12 extra amino acids on. Okay, so in insulin receptor B, it has an extra 12 amino acids. In insulin receptor A, it doesn't have those 12 extra amino acids. Okay, now, just to add a little bit more information onto our picture of the insulin receptor. So, basically, this is the amino terminus of the beta subunit here, and this is the carboxylic acid terminus down here. So the carboxyl terminus is intracellularly, and the amino terminus is extracellularly. And similarly, uh, for the alpha subunit, which is completely extracellularly, uh, this side down here that's facing towards the membrane is the carboxyl terminus, and this side up here is the amino terminus. Okay, right. And also another little bit of information the disulfide bonds between the two identical alpha subunits here are known as class 1 disulfide bonds. And again, even though it looks as though I've just drawn one, and that's because I have just drawn one, uh, there will be multiple of these. So these are class 1, let me bring this up. Okay, class 1 uh, disulfide bonds. Okay, uh, whilst uh, the disulfide bonds between the alpha and beta subunits, so these disulfide bonds here, and again there will be multiple of these, uh, these are known as class 2 disulfide bonds, so these are class 2 disulfide bonds. 
Okay, so we're now probably ready to uh, move on to discuss what happens when insulin actually comes and binds uh, to the insulin receptor. So that firstly, let's just have a little reminder of the structure of insulin. So insulin structure, again, it consists of two little polypeptides bound together by two disulfide bonds. Okay, so we have the uh, B chain here in green, which is the slightly longer one, and then we have the carboc uh, sorry, the A chain in blue here. So this is the B chain in green and the A chain in blue, and they're linked together by disulfide bonds. And this is an insulin molecule here. So what will happen is the insulin molecule will bind to the extracellular domain of the insulin receptor. So it's going to bind in between these two alpha subunits. So in it comes, it's going to bind in here. Okay, now what does it trigger? Well, basically it activates um, the insulin receptor. It activates certain special domains on the cytoplasmic sides of the beta subunits. So I'm going to add these in. So each of these beta subunits has a special domain uh, on its cytoplasmic sides. And these special domains are known as tyrosine kinase domains. So this is a tyrosine kinase domain. Okay? And basically, uh, these domains are tyrosine kinase enzymes. They can function as tyrosine kinase enzymes. So let me explain what a tyrosine kinase enzyme does. Basically, tyrosine kinase enzymes add uh, phosphate groups onto uh, tyrosine residues within proteins. So let me draw a tyrosine residue here. Okay, so when you talk about uh, amino acid residues rather than amino acids, basically you mean uh, the amino acid as though it's bound within a protein. Okay, so here's the amino group, and it's bound to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid before it. Then here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, and here's the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, so I've drawn it as though it's within a polypeptide rather than as though it's the pure amino acid. And the R group of a tyrosine amino acid residue consists of a methylene group, like so, with a benzene ring coming off it. So this is the benzene ring. And I'll just draw it as a hexagon with a circle in the middle. Okay, and then off the fourth carbon over here, you then have an alcohol group. So this is the structure of a tyrosine amino acid. Okay, and what a tyrosine kinase enzyme is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate tyrosine residues to create what are known as phosphotyrosine residues. So, what will happen is the tyrosine kinase enzyme will take an adenosine triphosphate molecule, okay, and it will cut off the final phosphate group of that adenosine triphosphate molecule and add it on to uh, the alcohol group of this tyrosine residue. Now I'm just going to show uh, this addition as though we're adding on a pure tyrosine, uh, sorry, a pure phosphate group rather than a phosphate group from ATP, but in reality it will come from ATP. So the structure of a pure phosphate group is a phosphorus atom with an oxygen atom doubly bound to it, then with two alcohol groups coming off the phosphorus atom, so here and here. And then also off the phosphorus atom, you have a single bond to an oxygen, which is then acquired uh, electro well an electron via ionic means, and has therefore gained a negative charge. Okay, uh, so this is a pure old phosphate group, sometimes called an inorganic phosphate group. Okay, and what will happen is you will take off the, well, you're going to form effectively what's known as a phosphoester bond. And to understand this, I would encourage you to think of this phosphate group as having a structure similar to a carboxylic acid group. So if you imagine this phosphorus atom isn't a phosphorus atom for a second, and is instead a carbon atom, so imagine replacing that with a carbon atom, then ignore the fact that it's got five bonds off it, which makes it a little uh, difficult to understand. But... Um, just look at this sort of a group here, where you've got a carbon double bound to an oxygen with an alcohol group. That's a carboxylic acid group. Okay, so think of this as similar to a carboxylic acid group. Now, carboxylic acid groups can interact uh, with alcohol groups. They can form ester links, and when they do that, what happens is the alcohol group comes off the carboxylic acid group. The hydrogen comes off the alcohol group. And those two things bind together to make water, and you then attach the oxygen from the alcohol 
onto the carbon of the carboxylic acid group, uh, which in this, in this case is a phosphorus atom. So we now have to revert back to the fact that this is a phosphorus atom. But basically, the reaction that you can have is exactly the same, basically. And this isn't called an ester link anymore. It's called a phosphoester link. Okay, so uh, you can link phosphate groups to uh, alcohol groups, and that is called a phosphoester link, basically. So uh, tyrosine kinase enzymes will do this uh, to alcohol groups on tyrosine residues within proteins. Now, uh, what's going to happen is when the insulin binds to the insulin receptor, the tyrosine kinase domains within the cytoplasmic uh, portions of the beta subunits, they're going to become active. And once they're active, what will happen is a process known as autophosphorylation. Okay, so where should I write this? I don't have much choice other than down here. So the process that's going to follow is called autophosphorylation. And basically, this is when... Uh, and now, I need to label these up. So let's call this tyrosine kinase domain 1, and let's call this tyrosine kinase domain 2. Okay, so tyrosine kinase domain on, in fact, we'll call the beta subunit. We'll call this beta subunit 1, and we'll call this beta subunit 2. So the tyrosine kinase domain on beta subunit 1 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on uh, the beta subunit of um, sorry, the beta subunit 2. Okay, so basically, uh, this cytoplasmic domain of the beta receptor subunit will also have many tyrosine residues. Now, the single letter code for a tyrosine residue is Y, so I'll just denote these as Y. Of course, these will also be on this side over here as well. So basically, what's going to happen is the tyrosine kinase domain of number 1 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosines on number 2. And the tyrosine kinase domain on number 2 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosines on number 1. So basically, you're going to get this cross-phosphorylation, basically. And it's called autophosphorylation because auto implies self, basically. Autonomy means self-governing. Autophosphorylation means self-phosphorylation. So we're viewing the insulin receptor as being one huge great receptor. So, of course, this is self-phosphorylation. It's phosphorylating itself. Or you could call it cross-phosphorylation if you were thinking of uh, the two beta subunits as separate. Um, okay, but autophosphorylation, I would say, is a more common uh, terminology than cross-phosphorylation. Okay, right. So what's going to happen is these tyrosine residues are going to get phosphate groups added onto them. So I'll just put little P's in circles to um, show this. So all of them have now got phosphate groups stuck onto them like so. Okay, and what this is going to do is it's going to allow a uh, protein to come and bind to the insulin receptor. And this is where the insulin receptor is different from other receptor tyrosine kinases. The first difference, in fact, and I should have mentioned this at the time, the first difference between this and a normal receptor tyrosine kinase is that usually receptor tyrosine kinases dimerize uh, when uh, the ligand binds, okay? This one is already dimerized, basically, because of the class 1 disulfide bonds. So it's different in that respect to the other receptor tyrosine kinases. In addition, usually what happens is once you've got phosphotyrosine residues on the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor, what happens is SH2 domains of target proteins come and bind to these phosphotyrosine residues and then uh, can are activated to do their downstream effect. In this case, what's going to happen is another protein is going to come and bind here. It will then have its tyrosine residues phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase domains uh, on the cytoplasmic side of our beta subunits of the insulin receptor. And though the phosphotyrosine residues on this next protein are going to recruit the SH2 domains of the downstream proteins. So it's different in that respect to most receptor tyrosine kinases. So there are those two ways in which it's very different from other receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, so we'll see what happens next in the next video.